welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Father, today we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, we give you thanks, we give you praise, glory and honor for what you've already done in this church service. God, we're just so uh, thankful that you would come and, and dwell amongst us, God, that your presence would be in this place, Lord, and that you would already touch us and encourage us during our times of praise and worship. God, we don't want to stop there. We want to go further with you. We want to go deeper, God. And so we pray, Lord, that as we open up your word, that you would open us up to receive it today. Open it up to us, God. Give us eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. May it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. Father God, we just pray, Lord, that you touch us, heal us, encourage us, strengthen us, Give us the vision and the direction that each and every one of us need for our individual lives. And Lord, we give you the praise, give you the glory for it. God, we don't just ask this blessing on ourselves also. We would ask it upon all the churches that are preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. Lord, there are brothers and sisters. We don't think of ourselves at any time as any better than anybody, God. But we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say, amen. amen. You may be seated. As you're having a seat, grab your Bible and go with me to the book of Hebrews, the fourth chapter. For those of you that are new with us, we go line upon line, precept upon precept in this church. We believe God wrote it that way, so we should be able to understand it that way. And we've been going through the book of Hebrews, and we've made it to Hebrews chapter number four, and we are now launching into verse number 14. Hebrews chapter four, verse number 14 says these words. It says, seeing then that we have a great high priest... Who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. The whole book of Hebrews is about Jesus, about his greatness, his preeminence, and we've already seen some things about Jesus. But now, here we come into verse number 14, and it says, seeing them, we ought to see something, we ought to know something, we ought to understand something about Jesus. Seeing then that we have a great high priest. Now, Jesus has already been referred to in chapter 2 as a merciful and faithful high priest. Jesus is merciful. You know, Jesus could have left us in our sin, could have dealt with us according to our sin. Each and every one of us deserve hell. And and Jesus would have been totally just and totally right to send us there. And yet he is a merciful high priest. What does that mean? That means that he doesn't deal with us according to our sin. He deals with us according to our faith in his blood and his sacrifice. So he is a merciful high priest, but also he's a faithful high priest. He didn't just clean us up, dust us off, set our feet upon a rock, and then say, hey, deal with life, I'll see you in heaven. Hopefully you make it. No, he's also a faithful high priest. The Bible says, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of our Lord. What does that mean? That means that Jesus said, listen, I may be going to the Father, but if I go to the Father, it's beneficial for you. Why? Because I will send you the helper. I will send you one just like me. But it's not just one me. Now it's me and each and every one of you. And now you have the power of God. You have the spirit of God. You have the wisdom of God, the anointing of God. You've got what you need for life. And so he's not only a merciful high priest, but he is also a faithful High priest. Chapter 3 comes along and says that we're to consider him our high priest. We're, what does that mean? That means we're supposed to think about him. We're supposed to look at him. We're supposed to look to him. We're supposed to contemplate. We are supposed to ponder. We're supposed to meditate on Jesus as our high priest. And so now here we are in verse number 14 of chapter 4 of Hebrews, and it says that seeing then that we have a great High priest. Now we find out that not only is Jesus a high priest, see, there were many high priests that had come before Jesus, many high priests who had done their job, many high priests who had gone before God, many high priests who had done the work of the Day of Atonement and gone into the presence of God and took care of the sin of the people for that year. And then the next year did the same, and then the next year did the same, and then the next year did the same. But today we see that we have not just a high priest, but we have a great high priest. Today, I want to talk to you about the great one. The title of today's message is The Great One. See, here on the earth, we, we see men and women who, who have accomplished things. In fact, the Olympics are going on right now, and we see people, you know, accomplishing great feats athletically. Great things are going on, and they're, they're, they've got Olympic records and world records and things that are taking place. And they say, oh, these people are great. In fact, there was a baseball player, right, guy who could 
the, 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 the sultan of swing, right? And, and this guy could hit a baseball. And they called him the great one. Oh, there was a basketball team that got together, right? And it was the first uh, combination of professional basketball players that joined together and got into the Olympics, and they called them the dream team. Oh, there's a dream team now, but the original dream team, they're saying, was the great ones, right? These were the ones that, that, that held every record, the ones that beat everybody, the ones that did everything, right? And they were the great ones. See, listen, I'm here to tell you today that no matter how great people are in sports, how great people are in education, how great people are in wealth and fame and fortune, they cannot compare to your Jesus. He is the great one. Love what Andrew Murray said. He said, the knowledge of the greatness and glory of Jesus is the secret of a strong and holy life. We all want to have a strong life. We all want to live a holy life. We all want to be pleasing to the Lord. But the knowledge of the greatness and glory of Jesus is the secret of a strong and holy life. Why? Because Jesus Christ lives on the inside of you. And if you get a knowledge about who the great one is on the inside of you, then he can work his life and live his life through you, and you'll have a strong and holy life. So today... I'm going to ask you a question, and we'll answer it a couple times today. But why is Jesus great? See, I could ask that question to you individually, and you, each and every person in this room could have a different answer. We could say, he's great because he saved me. He's great because he healed me. He's great because he took care of me. He's great because he comforts me. He's great because he put me in a family. He's great because he brought me to this church. He's great for so many reasons. Each and every one of us could have a different reason, and let me tell you something. Each and every one of those reasons would be 100% right. All of our reasons for why Jesus is great would be 100%, absolutely, yes, that's the right reason. So today, I'm not here to tell you that your reason is not the right reason, but I'm here to give you some reasons that we see in the Bible why Jesus is great. And as we apply these to your life, you'll see a greater picture of who our God is and who the great one is inside of you. So today, why is Jesus great? Number one is that he did what we could not do. Why is Jesus great? Well... He did what we could not do. We couldn't save ourselves. We couldn't take care of the sin issue in our life. God gave us a sacrificial system, right? And here's the high priest. And, and year after year after year after year, they're, they're doing the same thing. Why? Because the sin issue was never really taken care of. It was covered. It was handled that year, but it was never completely taken out of the way. We always had that issue in our life. And so here comes Jesus, our great high priest, and what does he do? He does away with the sacrificial system by the sacrifice of himself. No other high priest did that. No other high priest said, you know what? We're through with this system. I'll become the sacrifice. I'll do away with it. I'll make the change. Why? Because they weren't qualified to do that. They weren't perfect. They weren't spotless. They weren't sinless. So here comes Jesus, God in his glory, what, right? What does he do? He breaks from his side his son, robes himself in humanity, comes and lives and walks among us, lives the perfect, spotless, sinless life. And rather than slaying an animal, he himself goes to the cross and becomes the sacrifice for you and I. We couldn't do that. And not only that, when he was buried, the Spirit of God raises him from the dead, right? It seats him at the right hand of God in heavenly places. No other high priest could do that. No other high priest was qualified. That's why Jesus is our great high priest, because he is the ultimate sacrifice. He's the one who did away with the sacrificial system. He is the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, and now he has completed the work and finished redemption for you and I. You're there in Hebrews 4.14. Take a look at the next verse, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. What does that mean? That means that Jesus lived life just like you and I. Jesus went through problems. Jesus went through trials. Jesus was tempted. And not just tempted. He was tempted by the big dog, right? Satan himself comes and tempts Jesus in the wilderness. Satan himself looks for an opportune time and comes back. Satan himself is involved in this whole process. And yet, even though Jesus had the greatest onslaught that we could imagine coming against him, he never sinned, was never deceived. He was tempted, but yet was without sin. There were other high priests. These other high priests were tempted, and yet these other high priests sinned. And that's why they didn't qualify. Jesus Christ did what we could not do. He lived the perfect, spotless life. Sinless life. You're there in Hebrews, serve with me to the book of Romans. 
finding out some more about this, what Jesus did that we could not do. The book of Romans. Romans chapter number 5. We're going to take a look at two verses in Romans chapter 5. Verse number 6 and verse number 8. Romans chapter 5. Verse number 6 says this. For when we were still without strength, in due time, or some translations say in the fullness of time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now hold on a second. Hold on a second. For when we were still without strength, what does that mean? That means we were helpless. We were powerless. We were sinking in the middle of the ocean and going down. We were caught in the tar pits and just our head was poking out. And what does Jesus do? We couldn't save ourselves. We had no strength. We had no power. We had no ability. We had no authority. And Jesus Christ, at that moment, while we were still helpless, dies for us. Goes to the cross. Gives up his life. Becomes the sacrifice. Verse number 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What does that mean? We didn't even realize we were headed for hell. We didn't even know we had no strength. We were just blindly following the pack, going into the slaughterhouse. Didn't even realize what was ahead. And yet Jesus Christ saw us in this helpless state. Not only that, saw us in a sinful state. We were offensive to God. We were at war with God. And God loved us so much that he did what we could not do. We could not save ourselves. We couldn't get ourselves out of the mess we were in. Could not reach up to God and get a hold of him. So what does God do? God reaches down and gets a hold of us. Jesus Christ died for us. Thank you for those four-week claps. My goodness. Come on, guys. We're talking about our salvation here. We're talking about Jesus, the great one. Oftentimes I hear people say, well, you know what, I'll, I'll just wait until I can get my act cleaned up to come to God. Listen, Jesus didn't wait for your act to get cleaned up before he died for you. This is not about you working your way to God. It's not about that. Your worth is not based on your works. Your worth is based on Jesus. And the price that he paid for you, he loved you so much that he didn't want to be without you. And so what happened was he did what we could not do. He died in our place so that we could live with him forever. The great one. Why is Jesus great? Well, number one, he did what we could not do. Second thing that we see is that he went where we could not go. He went where we could not go. Hebrews 4.14, 4, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. What does that mean? That means that he ascended into heaven itself, went into the presence of God on our behalf. We couldn't do that. We were an offense to God before the blood of Jesus Christ was poured out. We were at war with God, and we could not get to God on our own. Now, the allusion here is to the high priest, once again. There were earthly high priests who had passed through the veils of the tabernacle and the temple and gone into the presence of God above the ark, poured out the blood on the mercy seat. So this high priest, he goes into the outer court, right, which everyone was allowed to go into the outer court. And that was okay, but he, there he made the sacrifice. And then he passes through the first door, going into the holy place of the temple. Now, only priests were allowed in this place. Only the priests could go inside. And so there he goes inside. And then he passes through the veil into the most holy place, into the presence of God on behalf of the people. And he sprinkles the blood of the sacrifice on the mercy seat. Now, only the high priest was allowed in. And he could only go in once a year. And after he was finishing his work of atonement for that year, he had to leave the presence of God. And there he would walk out, and he was the only one allowed to do that one day a year. But Jesus Christ did not go into the temple made with hands. He did not pass through those veils. No, he passed through the heavens. He came down to earth, and then he went through our atmosphere. Jesus was raised up. The Bible tells us that he disappeared in the clouds. And then he passed through the heavens into the spiritual realm, into heaven itself in the presence of God. He passed into the most holy place before God Almighty, and he poured out his own blood on the mercy seat and then sat down at the right hand of God and stays in the presence of God. Jesus did what we could not do, and Jesus went where we could not go. 
We see this expounded on in Ephesians chapter 4. You're there in Romans. Turn me to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to start in verse number 7 and read through verse number 10. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 7 says these words. It says, but to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Grace is God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on your behalf when you can't do it. God's power in me to do what his truth demands of me. So that means that to each one of us, ability, God's ability was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Verse number eight, therefore he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Verse number nine, now this he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. Verse number 10, he who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Now, sometimes we read a section of scripture like this and we don't understand what it's talking about. And so we say, hey, that's cool, I understand, and we just move on. But let's really dig deep for a second. Here's Jesus Christ, preeminent one, there in union and unity with the Father, sees the need and loves us so much that what did he do? He disrobed himself of his glory, wrapped himself in flesh, came and dwelt among us in humanity. He descended and came to us, died on the cross, and then the Bible records that he went into the lower parts of the earth. Now, there's been some confusion about this, and sometimes people think about this, and, and, and there's a, a misnomer that Jesus went to hell. Jesus did not. He descended into the lower parts of the earth, the Bible says. And there were two compartments spiritually in the earth that we find in the Bible. In the Old Testament, you see that there was hell, and there was also a place called Sheol. It was the place of the dead. This is the containment area where the Old Testament saints went who were looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. And so they were awaiting his arrival. In fact, Jesus speaks of the rich man and Lazarus. Now, sometimes people see that and they say, well, that is a parable. It is not a parable because Lazarus was a real person and he named him. And the rich man even said, send Lazarus to my brother's so that they don't end up here. What was it? He was in hell. He lifted up his eyes and he saw Lazarus. And they were in two compartments and he could see him a far distance off. And there was a great chasm fixed between the two of them. He couldn't cross over. And Lazarus awakens where? In Abraham's bosom. Abraham was a real man. And here's Abraham comforting him and holding him. Abraham's the father of faith. And Lazarus was looking forward to, with faith to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so here he is in Abraham's bosom. We also find out that that place is called paradise. We see it in the book of Revelation once again. So this is a real place. So then we read in Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 8, Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. So we see that Jesus Christ came to the earth, died on the cross, descended into the lower parts of the earth, and led captivity captive. What does that mean? He went down and he proclaimed his victory, the book of 1 Peter says, to the Old Testament saints and says, come on, boys and girls, let's go. I've won the victory. Come on, we're going to heaven now, into the presence of God. And he ascends on high, giving gifts to men, and then he goes into the presence of God and pours out his blood on the mercy seat. See, see they couldn't have entered into heaven until the blood was shed on the mercy seat. Now that the blood is shed on the mercy seat, they are acceptable before God and can enter into the presence of God. No earthly high priest went into heaven itself. Jesus now is there, seated at the right hand of God, and he is our advocate. Sometimes people say, well, what's Jesus doing right now? Is he just chilling? Is he just hanging out next to God, just sitting there waiting? To come back, waiting for God to say, go. No, Jesus has a present-day ministry. See, he's our high priest. And the Bible says he ever lives to make intercession for the saints. Jesus is not just chilling. No, Jesus is interceding on our behalf here and now. Jesus stands up whenever we have a need. In fact, if you read the book of Acts, you'll find Stephen lifts his eyes up to heaven, and there's Jesus, not seated, standing at the right hand of the Father. 
What's that mean? That means that when we have a need, when something's going on in our life, Jesus stands up on our behalf. He is our advocate. There was a story of a man in Greece who was a soldier named Antimus. He had committed treason and was to be tried. When his brother Aeschylus, who had lost an arm in the service of his country, heard of his trial, he ran to the court. As the sentence was about to be passed, he intervened, holding up the stump of his arm, and cried out, Antimus is guilty, but for Aeschylus' sake, he shall go free. In the same way, when our sin condemns us and the devil accuses us, Jesus holds up his scars and he says, yes, they are guilty, but because of my sacrifice, they are now declared righteous. Because Jesus went where we could not go that we now have access to the Father. Now our prayers are made acceptable because of the blood that was shed. Why is Jesus great? Well, number one, he did what we could not do. Number two, because he went where we could not go. Now listen, listen, listen. Before we go to number three, let me just say this. Jesus is great all by himself. If he never did a thing, Jesus is great. If he just stayed in heaven, he's great. Even if he let us go to hell, he'd be just and right in doing so, and he's still great. But listen, Jesus is also great because number three today, he brought us along. He brought us along. Yes, all by himself, he is great. But to me personally today... And to you personally today, he's great. Why? Because he brought us along. He didn't leave us in our sin. He didn't leave us on our way to hell. He cared so much about us. He loved us so much that he didn't want to live without us, so he died for us. And now he's raised again to life, and he brings us along with him. That's why Jesus is great to us today, here and now. Jesus came for a reason, and that reason was you and me. Came to seek and save that which was lost. We were so lost. Didn't even know it. We were deceived thinking we were doing the right thing when we were doing the wrong thing. My goodness. We were so good at sin, we practiced at it. Got good at it. Bragged about it. My goodness. Foolish. And yet Jesus comes and saves us, cleans us up, turns us around, gives us a right mind, shows us the way, and he brings us along. You're there in Ephesians. Turn me to the book of John. John chapter number 14, a great section of scripture, John chapter 14. We're going to be reading John chapter 14, verse number 2 through verse number 6. John chapter 14, verse number 2, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. It's contained in scripture for you and I to read because Jesus is speaking to us today. John chapter 14, verse number 2 says this. In my Father's house are many mansions, many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. Now, now, hold on. If it were not so, I would have told you. Why does Jesus need to tell us anything? Why does he need to involve us in this? I mean, it's just little old me. It's just us. And yet God is so invested, so interested, so loving and caring about our lives that he wants us to know. He includes us in the family business. He brings us along. See, oftentimes we feel like outcasts. We feel like the, the odd one out, like the fifth wheel. Everybody else has the inside track with God, but not me. Some of us feel like we always show up late to the party. You know what I mean by that? Like everybody's having a good time. We show up and they say, all right, guys, that was great. Hey, hey, good to see you, man. You showed up. Cool. All right, see you later. And here we are standing there left out in the cold. And yet God says, I don't want you left out. I don't want you wondering what the joke was about. I want you to come and laugh and celebrate with me. I don't want you to feel like an outcast. I want to involve you. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I would have included you. I would have let you know what's going on. It, it, just, it, just, it just totally blows me away when I think about Abraham. Here's Abraham having dinner with God. My goodness. God's about ready to leave. And before he leaves, he says, well, wait a second. Shouldn't I tell Abraham what I'm about to do? 
I'm sorry, you, you're God, creator of the heavens and the earth. Number one, why are you having dinner with a man? Number two, why do you need to include him in your plans? Because God loves us. God wants us to be involved in the family business. God wants to bring us along. Jesus Christ doesn't leave us out. He brings us in. He includes us. He doesn't exclude us. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Wow. That means Jesus is putting fresh towels and linens on the bed. That means Jesus has a robe with your name on it, hung up in the closet. It means Jesus is putting a little mint on the pillow. Don't think God does anything halfway. He's going to prepare a place for you. For the ladies, he's got a scented candle that you like. And for the men, he's got your man cave ready. Hello. <laughs> Glory to God. Verse 3, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. Look at these words. That where I am... There you may be also. Jesus wants to be with you. Jesus loves your company, even when you don't love your own company. Jesus is so invested and so involved in our lives. He wants to be with us. That where I am, there you may be also. Verse 4, and where I go, you know. And the way, you know. Now Thomas chimes in. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. And how can we know the way? Verse number six, very familiar verse. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Wow. That means that if we're going to get where Jesus is going, we got to get there through him. Jesus is the one that brings us along. Jesus is the vehicle that takes us to the Father. Jesus is our leader. Jesus is the one who opened the way, but Jesus is also the way. Sometimes we say, well, I don't, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do this life. I don't know what I should be doing. Listen, you got to get to Jesus. He is the way. Sometimes we say, I don't even know what a lie is in my life. I'm believing so many different things. I don't know whether to believe the news or the politicians or the educators, my neighbors, my friends, my experiences. Listen, don't believe any of them. Believe Jesus. Why? He's the truth. And sometimes we look at our life and we say, this is not living. Everybody else has and I don't have and I don't understand and I don't know why. Listen, any life without Christ is not worth living. It's time to get to Jesus and get a hold of a real life. He loves you. He wants the best for you. It's not time to end it. It's time to start it. It's time to get a hold of Jesus in your life and start really living. We've got to learn to follow our leader, Jesus. Just as Jesus brought us along, we got to bring him along. Let's be wise here. Think about it for a second. Jesus is going after us, bringing us along. We should be wise enough to go after him and bring him along. See, this message would be a great message. Get us fired up, encouraged. You learn something. To oh, I learned something today. Feel good about it. Get, get a little Holy Ghost goosebumps during praise and worship. Learn something and you can go out of this place and feel good about going to church. Doesn't do you any good if you don't apply it to your life. Might as well have stayed home. But Jesus wants us involved. Jesus doesn't want us on the sidelines. He wants us in the game. Jesus wants to include us, and if Jesus is going after us and bringing us along, we need to go after him and bring him along. My daughter, one morning at the breakfast table, says, Daddy, I'm going on a safari. And I'm going to bring apples and an aardvark. And I thought, that's quite strange to bring on a safari. And she looks at me with a smile. And she says, what are you going to bring? 
wow, okay, I'm going on a safari. What am I going to bring? I said, well, I think I'm going to bring a tent and a, um, you know, I'll bring a, a sleeping bag. She says, you cannot come. <laughs> I was very shocked. And she says, Daddy, I'm going on a safari, and I'm going to bring bananas and bears. What are you going to bring? And I said, well, I was really intent on having a place to sleep and, and a covering, but I guess um, it's a safari, so I'll, I'll bring a Jeep and some gasoline so that I don't run out out there in the wilderness, you know. So I'll, I'll bring a Jeep and some gasoline. She says, you cannot come. <laughs> and I'm thinking, what is so wrong with my packing list? <laughs> she says, Daddy, listen closely. I'm going on a safari. I got that part. <laughs> she says, and I'm going to bring... Crystals and candy. And I started to get it. She started with A. She went to B. Now she's at C. She says, what are you going to bring? I said, I'm going to bring a didgeridoo and a dog. <laughs> and she says, you can come. <laughs> What's the point? Oftentimes we bring the wrong things. We come to Jesus and we say, I got all this fear, I got all this doubt, I got all this frustration. He says, you can't come. We say, but wait a second, Jesus, I got trials and problems and pains and pressures. He says, they may all start with P, but you cannot come. <laughs> but Jesus, I don't have enough. My husband, my wife, my kids, my neighbors, my co-workers, my boss. He says, you can't come, and your boss can't come either. <laughs> what does Jesus want us to bring? He wants us to bring faith. He wants us to bring Jesus. He wants us to bring his word. He wants us to bring our lives. See, we got to bring the right things. We bring the fear, the frustration, the lack, the need, the sin, and the stain. Rather, let's not bring the junk of this world. Let's bring Jesus. He's greater than the problem, greater than the trial, greater than any need. My goodness. Remember that it says we have a great high priest. Rather than having the problems, let's let go of the problems and have Jesus in our life. Let's get a hold of Jesus. Let's get a hold of his word. Back there in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, let's take a look one more time at what it says. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. What is our confession? Well, we've been talking about the Word. Remember Hebrews chapter 4? The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Let us bring the Word of God, Jesus, the living Word of God. Let's bring it into every area of our life. When you start to see the problems, start to see the frustrations, start to see the trials, you start to speak. Bring Jesus into it. Bring the Word of God into it. If you're believing for your healing, it's time to start declaring, by His stripes, I was healed. Bring Jesus into your health. In your finances, when you don't have enough, you start to declare the word of God and say that my God shall supply all of my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Bring Jesus into your finances. If your family's a mess, it's time to bring Jesus into your family. Listen, he is the best marriage counselor. He is the best children's counselor. He is the best personal counselor you will ever have in your life. And it's time to bring Jesus into that situation. My children are taught of the Lord, and great shall be their peace. And even though they may wander, they will return to their borders. It's time to declare the word of God and bring Jesus into every area of your life. Let's bring them along, church. In the Bible, we see three types of biblical confession. We see that God is praised. That's a confession that we praise the Lord. That is our confession. God is good. God is great. God is wonderful. God is God. There is no other God beside him. God is praised. Second thing is that sin is acknowledged. We confess our sins, and God is faithful 
and just to forgive us and cleanse us. But the last one is that faith is declared, and that's our confession, and we are to hold fast to that confession. It is the believing yes which stands above every unbelieving no in our lives. And so, church, we must confess Jesus and his word over our life each and every day. Why? Because he's greater than our life. Greater than all, he is the great one. Three things that we learned today. Why is Jesus great? Number one is because he did what we could not do. Number two is because he went where we could not go. And number three is because he brought us along. If you got something from the word today, come on, give God a great big grace. Hallelujah. Glory to God, glory to God. Want to make sure your heart is right with God before you leave. Some people have already got up and left, not just some people, a lot of people. And I would ask one more time, please stay put, please remain seated. God is talking to you about your eternal destiny. And so if you got up and you walked out, I know you can hear me out there in the foyer, out there in the breezeways, hello. Come on, listen up, stay put for a second. God wants to speak to you about your eternal life. I, I, I know you can hear me in the bathrooms. Stay put. Listen up. God wants to talk to you right where you're at. Let me ask you a question. I want you to answer the question in your heart. No one will know the answer but you and God. What if today was your last day on the earth? You died. Would you end up in heaven or would you go to hell? Just answer that question in your heart. You don't have to answer it out loud. Just in your heart. God knows your heart. God knows where you're at. Now let's examine your answer. Some of you said, well, I, I would have go to heaven because I don't believe in hell. Listen, hell's a very real place. Jesus spoke about hell. We talked about it today. Old and New Testament, you'll find hell all through the Bible. It's a very real place. Just because you deny its existence doesn't make it any less real. It's like saying, I don't believe in semi-trucks. Go stand on the slow lane of the freeway. You'll find one very soon. Just by denying hell's existence doesn't make it any less real. Come on, don't bury your head in the sand and expect to stay out of hell. Sometimes people say, well, I'd go to heaven because all roads lead to heaven. You get there your way, I'll get there my way. Well, I'll get there somehow. No, listen, it doesn't work like that. Jesus, we quoted it today, said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man goes to the Father except by me. Can't get there your way. Can't get there my way. Can't get there some well-meaning church committee way. It's not how this works. Come on, we got to get there God's way. Sometimes people say, well, I, I'll go to heaven because I've been a good person. God lets good people into heaven. Really, I don't see that anywhere in the Bible. Could you say that to me in the Bible where it says God lets good people into heaven? Can you, can you show me behind the maps, the grading scale, how good you have to be? Be this good and then God will let you into heaven. It doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible does it say just be good, God lets you into heaven. In fact, the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You're not going to make there just by being good. Got to get there God's way. Sometimes people say, but I was raised in church. Parents told me I was a Christian growing up. Took me to religious classes. Hung religious jewelry around my neck, a cross, St. Christopher. Had me baptized a Christian as a child. Born in America, America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist or Muslim or Hindu. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, right? Wrong. You know that nowhere in the Bible does it say raised in church. Parents tell you you're Christian. That makes you a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you wear religious jewelry, go to religious classes, or be baptized as a Christian as a child. You get to go to heaven. Nowhere in the Bible say America is a Christian nation. Everybody born in America gets to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. And again, I don't see anywhere in the Bible that because you're not some other religion that by default, God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. Come on, let's talk today. Let's not play games. I love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. If that's how you think you're going to get to heaven, you're not going to make it. Sometimes people say, but not only when I was a child did I go to church here, I'm sitting in church in front of you right now, preacher. I mean, come on. I, I, I consider myself to be a Christian. I, I'm here in church. That's great. I'm glad you're here in church. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible says sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian? That's like sitting in the ocean, calling yourself a fish, and you think that's going to make you a fish. Mm -mm. Just a wet human sitting there. Nowhere in the Bible says say you sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Sometimes people say, I get that, I get that. But, but listen, you don't understand. My last church, I got involved. I helped out. I sang in the choir for a number of years, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. Taught in the Bible classes, even got a membership card to that church. That's great. Once again, glad you did those things. But could, could you just show that to me in the Bible? Where you help out, sing in the choir, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions. People think of you as a leader that gets you into heaven. It doesn't work like that. 
Nowhere in the Bible see you teaching the Bible classes. You get to go to heaven. I don't see anywhere in the Bible that it says that because you got a membership card that God's waiting at the gates of heaven looking for your membership card before you can enter. Not going to make it if that's how you think you're going to get there. Sometimes people say, but I know God. I know about Jesus. I know about Easter and the resurrection. Celebrate Christmas every year of my life and sing the songs. I could quote scriptures to you, Pastor, Old and New Testament. It's great. Once again, I'm glad you did those things. But have you read your Bible? No, the Bible says demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians. The Bible says the devil himself quotes scriptures, and that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. Look up here. Look up here. Not about what you have in your head. Not about some mental ascent towards God. Having head knowledge about who Jesus is. Rather, this is about your heart. God has always been after your heart. Beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. It's always been the same thing. Jesus was speaking to a religious leader of his day, probably better than all of us in this room. Did a lot of good deeds. Was raised up in his church called the synagogue. He became a leader, got involved, could quote the scripture, could sing the scripture. How many of us could do that? And yet when Jesus speaks to this great man, he doesn't say, hey, you're doing a great job. Just keep doing what you're doing and I'll see you in heaven. No, Jesus is the great one. And it's what he says that counts. And so what does he say to this religious leader? He says, you want to enter the kingdom of heaven? You must be born again. Now, I, I know our society has made a mockery out of that term. They've raked it to the coals. Not about what society says or pop culture. It's about what the Bible says. What does being born again mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship. Let me prove it to you. In the book of Revelation, third chapter, Jesus is speaking to the church just like he's speaking to this church today. He says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what's he saying? What does lukewarm mean? What's that all about? Well, lukewarm means a little in, a little out. A little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and then, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, look out. Why do I say look out? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But he said, if you deny me, I will deny you. So today, your call, your choice. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. And when I say three, I'm going to pop my hands together just like this. Bang! When you hear the sound of my hands pop together just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to lift your hands. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to be born again. I want to be headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. You can, I'll count it. You can put it right back down right afterwards. You say, whoa, 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 wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh, you might be. Get over that. Why do I say that? Because think about it. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever? You'd raise anything you could. All your hands, your arms, your legs. You'd raise your underwear on a flagpole if you could, if that would get you out of hell. But listen, there's no exits. And so today, you have a choice. You have an opportunity before you. Today is the day of salvation, the Bible says. So don't wait. Don't put it off till tomorrow. Listen, we're not assured tomorrow Jesus could come back or it could be the end. We don't know. So come on today. Consider your life. Consider where you're at. And make a decision. Will you give him all of your heart? And will you give them all of your life? Now, who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on today, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never given God all your heart and all your life? Come on, I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? You know, that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Come on. You can get right with God in this safe and friendly place. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, if you're watching my television in the foyer or the Love Rock Cafe or even online, you can raise your hand right where you're at. God sees you. And then you can tell an usher right afterwards, come into the church service, or if you're watching online, click the blue button that says respond to God. Someone will lead you in a prayer. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Thank you. There's one, two, three, four, five. Thank you. Six, seven. Thank you. Eight, nine. Up on top. Ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Thank you. Fourteen. Thank you. God bless you. 15, 16. Thank you. Up in this section, and just give me a little wave. If the, if, thank you. Thank you. 17. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? Uh, over here. Thank you. Got you up there. In the family rooms, is there one? Up on top? Where you at? Just give me a little wave up there. 
All right, praise God, I got you, got you, number 18. Anybody else real quick down here in these sections, 18? 18 wise people, anybody else real quick on this side, 18, 19, thank you, God bless you. 19, where are you at? Where are you at? Thank you, number 20, God bless you, 21, gotcha, gotcha. Anybody else real quick, 22 up on top, 23, 24 in the family rooms, just two hands, all right, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank God. Anybody else? 23, 24. Thank you. God bless you. Where are you at? Number 25. You're sitting there wondering if you should do this. You should do this. Come on, go for it right now. If that's you, just lift up your hand high. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? Come on, number 25. Your heart's beating out of your chest, and you know you need to do this. Come on. Let's go for God today. Where are you at? Number 25. Anybody else real quick? Just pop your hand up when I'm looking in your direction. Anybody else? There's a lot of people got saved over here. Where are you at right here? Come on. Come on, let's go. Thank you, number 25. God bless you. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is so good, so good, so good. All right, all 25 of you, if you're number 26, 27, 28, 29, or 30, hello. Come on, it's not too late. Here's what I want you to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand, give a clap, sing a song. As we do that. I want you to get your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church. Bring a friend if you need a friend, and I want you to get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies today, but we can't do that till we get you down here. If you're sitting next to somebody and they raise their hand, say, come on, friend, I'll go with you. All right, so let's all stand and welcome them as they come. You raise your hand, you should raise your hand. You come right now. Just come on down. No one leave. Let them come. From the family rooms, bring your kids. Come on down. Come on down. Hallelujah. They're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. You can come too. We're still coming, come on, come on, get your stuff, get a friend if you need a friend, get in the aisle and meet me up front. We're still coming, come on, you can come too, this is your time, this is your moment of salvation. Somebody else if you need to come, come on. In the family rooms, bring your kids. Come on, come on, come on. Somebody else, come on down. Hallelujah. They're still coming. Come on, come on, we'll wait for you. You can come too. They're still coming. Somebody else, come on, come on, come on. All right, all right. Hey, everybody up front, look up here for a second. Put a smile on your face. This is a good thing. It's not a bad thing, all right? You came to give God all your heart, came to give God all of your life. Now, look over to my right, your left. See this guy waving at you right here in the cool hat? This is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave is a really neat guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. Sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? Listen, he's cool, all right? He's going to do three things with you. Number one thing he's going to do with you, he's going to pray with you a simple prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. Second thing he's going to do, he's going to give you some free stuff. A couple little booklets that our pastors wrote that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. And then finally, he's going to introduce you to a friend we have in church called a spiritual personal trainer. Now, you heard of a physical trainer. It helps you get strong, right? Make sure that you're working out the right way. Spiritual personal trainer will do that for you spiritually. He'll describe how it works. Now, listen, 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 listen. It's a five-week program. Teach you five things out of the Bible. That's one a week. That'll help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. You need to do it. It's free. It's easy. And it'll help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. Now, I'm going to make a promise to you. Okay? If you will give God one year of your life here at this church, and you plug in, and you get going with God, at the end of this year that you give to God, you will look back on your life, and you will say, my goodness, I never dreamed it could be this great and this awesome. God will do great and mighty things in your life. It all starts with five weeks with an SPT to help you to get started out on the right foot. So if you guys will make a left turn, follow Pastor Dave, let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Woo!